but more importantly, just more connectivity to what makes the business grow and, and thrive. I just don't think that BPO has, has found that unlock yet. Welcome to the GBS Masterminds podcast, the one and only platform for global business service leaders to share their experiences of building world-class shared service organizations. My name is Sashi Narahari, founder and CEO of iRadius, and I'll be your host. Today, I'm delighted to host Matthias Bax, a business leader with 25 years of experience working with global brands such as Lufthansa, Office Depot, Japanese Tobacco. Currently, Matthias is heading the GBS organization of PepsiCo. Matthias, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Sashi, for having me. All right, Matthias, I guess we can get started with brief background about your career. Maybe you can just tell us how, how it has evolved over the years. Absolutely. It's, it's been a long way, so uh, <laughs> going to have to remember everything. But I, I really started my career at Lufthansa a while back, and I always dreamt to work for an airline. Uh, started in corporate strategy. Uh, part of the you know corporate strategy remit was to build a GBS for for Lufthansa. And I was, you know, the, the newbie, so I didn't, you know, I didn't put my foot uh, backwards fast enough. So I got, hey, you're going to have to do GBS. And that's how I learned about GBS. And it's been, you know, it's been a great ride ever since. Uh, moved to uh, moved to Office Depot in the U.S. to build their GBS from scratch. Uh, then moved to Japan Tobacco to inherit, you know, their GBS organization and, and improve it. And then lately, uh, you know, start building the GBS organization for PepsiCo. So a lot of different countries. So you are kind of like the international man of mystery. So we're really looking forward to getting your feedback on the six dead or alive questions. You ready? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think one of the things I want to say is that the kind of the big learning is that you know different cultures, different companies, different industries, different you know central driven, decentral driven, you know high margin, low margin, retail, CPG. What I learned is there's no one way of doing GBS. And, and I think, you know, this is one of the learnings is what works in one company doesn't necessarily work you know, anywhere else. You bet. All right. So I'm going to jump into the first dead or alive question, Matthias. In 10 years, do you think BPOs for outsourcing will be dead or alive? It will be dead. Actually, I think it's already dead in its current form. Look, I think that the, the whole model of bums in seats, you know, how many headcounts, doing stuff, and, and kind of maintaining that is just an outdated concept. I want to talk about value. I want to talk about digital products. I want to talk about improvements, user experiences. So I think, you know, the current model is that. And I think they're going to have to reinvent how they bring value and how the commercial relationship reflects that. I think if they're not able to do that, I think the industry will be that. Understood. So it's almost like the labor cost arbitrage play has been done by most um, companies. And that was a core business model for the BPO companies. And they cannot just do that to survive. So they need to kind of shift into what next would happen, right? What you do is you rebase your cost once. And it gives you probably three to five years of, of grace period, right? But then what? And I just see in general that executives and business leaders, with all the digital transformation that's happening around them, they are looking for this unit to give them just a better experience, an even better cost, right? But more importantly, just more connectivity to what makes the business grow and, and thrive. I just don't think that BPO has, has found that unlock yet. Got it. Makes sense. All right. We'll go to the next question. This is around physical service centers, Matthias. In 10 years, will large centralized service centers be dead or alive? We have just kind of had the two years of COVID effect, and there is a lot of talk around work from home, work from anywhere, RTO. What do you think will happen to the large centralized service centers? Hey, Shashi, if you would have asked me this six weeks ago, I would have said you absolutely dead. After my trip to, to our centers, it's going to be alive and kicking. And I had a very interesting conversation with my team. And we, we said, basically, why do we exist, 
right? Why does a company like PepsiCo invest in talent and, and GBS? And we all said, hey, we need to innovate. We need to create. We need to collaborate. We need to celebrate. And I asked them, can we do that if everybody is working just on Zoom? And the real clear answer from the team was absolutely not, right? So I truly believe that if you think about it, Shashi, why did GBS gets created? Yes, there is there's a labor play, right? A cost play. But ultimately, it's to bring people together that can look across geographies, across functions, across physical boundaries that companies have and say, how can we do this better? How can we innovate? And what I learned now the last two years, yeah, we can all work on Zoom to keep the plane at the same altitude. But if we want to, you know, if we want to pitch up, you're going to have to have a significant component of people physically coming together to co-create, to co-innovate, etc. Now, does it mean everybody needs to be back five days in the office per week? No. But I do believe the concept of togetherness and and that collaborative nature, what GBS is known for, I actually think is going to be even needed more if we truly want to innovate you know, our processes and, and capabilities. Yeah, it's a very interesting you say that. So I think the clear emerging trend from how we felt last year during like peak COVID, everything can be remote to then we said, no, we got to have hybrid to now a lot of companies. In fact, we actually announced a full return to the office and we ourselves actually shifted over the last few months on our own point of view. So very interesting. All right, we'll go to the question number three, uh, dead or alive, RPA. This is a kind of an interesting topic, Matthias. In the next 10 years, do you think RPA in the current form, what I mean by that is the ASI screen flow automation, will it be dead or alive? It will be alive, absolutely. And it has to be, right? Unless the SAPs and sales forces of this world are going to you know, solve the world problems. Uh, I always believe, you know, there is a, absolutely room for RPA. Got it. I guess maybe on a, on a similar track around technology is the next question, which is AI. What are your thoughts on AI in GBS 10 years from now? Will it be dead or alive? You also know that AI is a lot of hype. And then in the real world case studies of really AI working. So I'm just curious, like there is today with respect to AI, but how do you feel about AI like a decade from now? It's very much alive, Shashi, and, and it's like RPA as well, right? Because ultimately, if we want to truly digitize end-to-end -end user experiences, and we're looking at that at PepsiCo at the moment, right? Like the employee experience. And how can we leverage AI to know that, hey, Matthias, typically on Friday, you look at this report, here it is. Or, hey, it's the end of, you know, it's March, you're going to have to do all of your objective setting, et cetera. Here is the link to do so. So these are fairly basic things, right? But they can be extremely enriching from a user experience perspective. And especially if you then use machine learning on top of that, right, where we constantly evolve these algorithms and these scripts. I truly believe that coming back to the RPA question, you cannot solve that at the ERP layer. I think they have a different purpose, right? They're the engine. They're they're important in themselves from a system of record perspective, but you know there's no one system of records. So you need to have that orchestration layer, RPA, AI, machine learning, you know, chatbots. The one thing I would say though, Shashi, what what I always you know I'm very keen on. It's not about the technology. The technology is there, right? It's about how do you create content? How do you deal with your data? Because you can have a, a superior technology chatbot, AI, you know, conversational chatbot, but what business rules is this going to call? And who's maintaining that? And how do we make sure if something changes that somebody remembers to change the business rules? So I think this is where we put a lot of our bets and our investments. Technology-wise, you know, PepsiCo and, and our CIO, CTO, they've done a fantastic job building the technology stack. It's now upon us to, to fill it with content. It's a very interesting perspective, Matai. So what you're saying is there'll always be the core ERPs, the Salesforce as a core systems, but you cannot expect them to go deeper, especially the data explosion and what you can do with AI kind of technology. So how do you have a corporate enterprise architecture stack where you have different solutions for different layers and specialist vendors and so forth for that? Is that a good summary? Absolutely. Awesome. Next question is actually switching topics. It's kind of related to the labor arbitrage question we 
discussed earlier. In 10 years from now, what do you see your take on India as a service center location? As you know, the wages in India are always increasing. The inflation rate is a big problem globally now, but it has always been the case in India for the last decade. So do you think if you had to forecast like 10 years from now, India will be a top choice for service center locations or would it be dead? No, I think I think it will absolutely be alive and, and thriving because from my perspective, right, GBS is not a it's not a cost play. As I said before, yeah, you can rebase your cost, but it, it doesn't excite the company. It doesn't give you longevity. It doesn't give you relevance. It's a one time play. And I think what India has done extremely well and I'm, I'm very you know impressed by is just the sheer ecosystem from just the talent that it can provide the ecosystem around this talent. And yes, I'm sure costs will go up, right? But it just means that that talent needs to automate more and needs to provide more value in different areas. And, you know, we have super good experiences in India with, you know, being able to attract top talent, like, like in other parts of the world that we operate in, but to really help us drive that next level of innovation of our processes and capabilities. So yeah, the, I think the labor increase will be more than offset by by incremental value that this you know great talent pool will provide. Got it. And that brings us to the next question, which is maybe a, the hardest one for you since you're a GBS leader. What do you think about the fate of GBS itself in ten years from now? Will GBS as an organization be dead or alive? All right, context is going to be very important, but I will say it's going to be dead. Now, that might sound very controversial, but let me explain, Shashi. I think, again, the notion of moving work to GBS, it doesn't excite companies, right? How can you truly become part of the fabric of a company? In my view, is not just to create a GBS organization, set up your process towers, you know, and kick it, right? It's how can you truly integrate with the business end to end? How can you make sure, like, our mission is to fuel PepsiCo's growth, right? PepsiCo has a growth agenda. We exist to fuel that growth. So how we do that is to really forge these partnerships to a point where I don't want to call us GBS anymore. We're just part of PepsiCo, like everybody else. And I think if you position GBS as kind of a service provider, at, at kind of as an appendix, I just, you know, when I talk to my peers and, and other companies, it feels like that's a losing strategy. And I think those GBSs ultimately will, will kind of disappear. They, they will be integrated into broader transformative parts of the company. That's why I think we really need to build that like a digital ecosystem, build, foster the relationships with the business, understand the real business problems that we can help solve. And I think if you do that, it's really no longer GBS, right? Global business services. It really, you get into the solution, into the capability space. Now you get the company excited about what you can provide. Now, doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on cost and, and continue to drive that level of productivity. It still gives you a seat at the table, but it cannot be the only thing that you're doing. You bet. Well said, Matthias. And I really appreciate you being bold and blunt because your experience and your background means a lot for the GBS community. On a closing note, do you have any advice to other GBS leaders? You've seen a lot. What would you give advice to other your younger self for starting careers in GBS or to your peers? I think the first and foremost, Shashi, GBS is a talent play. It's about human beings and human centricity. And even myself, sometimes I get carried away by digitization and automation and you know, all technology, and you really forget what makes a GBS organization great is its people. And it comes a little bit back to the discussion we had before about, you know, office, big centers. I truly believe that we need to be careful that we're not losing the human centricity that has made GBS great. Otherwise, we just become a, an impersonal piece. So that's, I think, one clear thing. I think the other piece is you need to decode the DNA of the company. And as I said before, what the way you, you drive a GBS, like you know, PepsiCo is a perfect example. We are a very 
entrepreneurial local company because food and beverage is very local, tastes, sights, sounds. So I need to make sure that I can be relevant for those teams that, you know, go talk to our consumers, go talk to our customers. I cannot be remote from the business, like maybe when you're in a bank or you're, you're a little bit more impersonal. So that's kind of, I think, lesson number two. And I think lesson number three is, and I learned this sometimes, it's more personal. Sometimes I just need to get out of the way to let the teams get on with it because they have all the answers. They, they deal with the issues every day. They know better. So how can we become their coaches? How can we become their, their supporters? How can we become their support center as leaders so that they can thrive and, and maximize their potential? So those are kind of three things that I think about a lot. Great advice, Matthias. Thank you so much. This has been a very insightful conversation. And it was a delight to have you on the GBS Masterminds podcast today. Hey, thank you so much and uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. That was the GBS Masterminds podcast. For more information, visit gbsmasterminds.com and make sure to search for GBS Masterminds in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And on behalf of the team here at High Radius, thanks for listening.